Good evening. I would like to call the January 4th Planning Commission meeting to order. Happy New Year. Please note that this meeting is being hosted through live stream on the city's website and by teleconference via Zoom. Due to the structure of the meeting, I would like to remind the Planning Commission to have their microphones turned on and positioned so the audience can hear. Director King, may we have a roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Hill? Present. Commissioner Lemke? Present. Mr. Beamsterfer? Here. Vice Chair Van Arsio? Here. Chair Worth? Here. Thank you. Uh, invocation of flag salute, Commissioner Beamsterfer. Would you stand your flag salute and player, player, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here tonight. And uh, Lord, I just pray that we ring in this New Year's with good health and uh, good prosper business for our city. And uh, we just pray that you just keep us all safe and healthy. Amen. Thank you. Item uh, four, approval of the minutes. Any comments, changes, revisions to the uh, meeting minutes? Move that we approve the minutes of December 21st, 2021. Second. Motion carries five zero. All right, item number five, public comment period. This next item on the agenda is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Are there any members of the public present that would like to comment on an item that is not on the agenda? And then are there any members of the public joining via teleconference or Zoom that would like to comment? Thank you. Are there, were there any e-comments that were received? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we will move forward to item uh, six or to agenda item six. And uh, Director Kang, if it's okay, we'd like to move forward the uh, item 6D to the front. Um, site development review SDR 21-013, conditional use permit uh, uh, CUP 21-007 and public convenience or necessity PCN for 21-003 uh, and tentative parcel map map 21-003 for the Arco AMPM gas station and commercial and commercial center. Um, Mina, would you mind coming forward? Thank you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the Planning Commission on Public. My name is Mina Morgan. I'm the project planner for site development review 21-013. Conditional use permit 21-007, public convenience and necessity 21-003, and tentative parcel map map number 21-003 for Arco AMPM gas station and commercial center. We had this item scheduled for hearing um, today. However, after communicating, communicating with um, it's Arco AMPM. E. 60, um, we moved item 60 forward. So we had this item scheduled for hearing today. Um, however, after communicating with the police department, we were informed that the public convenience and necessity, the PCN, is still in progress. And um, 
the PCM determination will be provided to staff on January 3rd. Um, because of that, staff is uh, requesting to continue this item to the January 18th, 2022 hearing and all the public correspondence, um, if any from today, will be addressed in the, during our next hearing. Great, thank you. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll open up the, the public hearing and, um, so, but, but do we have any questions for staff first? No. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open up public hearing. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to this item? None at this time. Is there any e comments or anybody on Zoom that would like to? Um, I don't have anyone on Zoom, but we did receive four uh, public comments for 60, yes. Okay, would we like to read those now or incorporate those in for the January 18th meeting? We can read it into the record tonight. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the first comment is from a Jeremiah Herterick. Uh, there are enough gas stations in fast food for our region. Uh, the next one is from Nicole Gooden. I live next to this field and this would absolutely be detrimental to our neighborhood. These types of businesses invite low life people and noise disturbances. There is already a car that was on the other corner, which already creates lots of noise for us. Our house will be on the market if this is approved. Next one is for a Dan Burns. This is regarding proposed development at Saboba and Florida Avenue in Hemet. I live at 4913 Maryland Street. I bought the home new in 1983. This center would be built 25 feet from my back bedroom window. Restaurants with drive throughs beer and wine sales, including a car wash and gas station that would be 24 hours. It is already loud in my home from traffic at Florida Avenue and a current car wash. One can only imagine having this virtually in their backyard. Doctor's offices or other types of developments would be acceptable, but this proposal I believe is unacceptable. I also feel it would bring down my property value and bring crime to the area. I urge you not to approve this. Sincerely, Dan Burns. Finally, this one is also from Jeremiah Hederick. I have concerns about the increase of homeless entering the area because of what gas stations bring. The potential of increased traffic due to access of our streets from the back lot, which could jeopardize the safety of our children who play on our street. Thank you. Okay, public hearing is open. Uh, is there a motion to continue? I'd like to make a motion to that the Planning Commission continues this item to January 18, 2022 hearing. I'll second. <clears throat> lit up. <clears throat> Motion carries five zero. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move to back to six A for site development review twenty dash zero zero two modification number one to the Latham. Good evening. Good evening, Chair, members of the Planning Commission and the public. I'm Monique Alanis, later project planner for uh, SDR 20-002 modification number one for the Latham. The applicant is Heron and Rumsdorf Architects Incorporated. The property owner is US Pacific Capital Inc. The uh, subject property is located on the south side of Latham Avenue, east of Lyon Avenue and west of Elk Street. The uh, applicant is requesting to modify an approved senior apartment complex that was approved uh, last year. Uh, this is the location of the property. Uh, surrounding land uses are uh, mobile, mobile home park residence to the north and east and commercial uh, to the south. Uh, the uh, general plan um, land use designation is high density residential, which allows for uh, 30.1 to 45 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the property is zoned R4, uh, high, high density residential. 
So um, last year, June 16th, 2020, the Planning Commission approved the uh, site development review for the construction of 120 senior living apartment units. Um, this is the current layout or as approved by the Planning Commission. Um, the overall development includes two primary access points into the site from the east and the west uh, with um, a wraparound drive through um, as well as a uh, porta cache um, circular driveway to allow for um, drop off at, at the middle um, of the development, uh, actually the, the midsection of the front of Latham to uh, access the development. Um, amenities are including indoor recreational amenities as well as outdoor open space. Um, there was an allowance to provide a little bit less open space on the outdoor um, as to offset that was additional um, amenities on the indoor. Here's the proposed um, overall layout of the modified plan as, as presented here, it is quite similar and consistent. Um, there are no changes in general to the overall layout, parking, uh, circulation, uh, setbacks, um, the um, allowable or the, the required open space as um, approved um, last year by the Planning Commission. Um, what I would like to do though is outline a few of the changes that were made. So overall, um, the proposed change resulted in reducing the number of uh, dwelling units to from 120 to 111, um, <clears throat> which uh, reduced the overall density from 36.25 to 33.5, which is still within the allowable range for um, the general plan. The overall square footage of the building, the, the total floor area, um, reduced from 170,898 to 107,267. Um, what's interesting is that although that the overall floor area of the development reduced, the footprint of the building actually increased um, by approximately 1,000 square feet. And I'll explain, <clears throat> explain what those changes are. So um, on the um, first floor, they reconfigured the first floor um, I'll kind of show how that looks here. Um, as you can see in this uh, architectural elevation, um, the top is what was approved and it shows um, the rear of the building. And you can see that top floor where it's highlighted in yellow is three stories. And so the overall reduction was um, as proposed on the lower is they eliminated um, two of the floors on the back wing. And then they reconfigured the first floor and they reshifted um, the uh, amenities uh, uh, to the first floor only. Um, they have um, are still in compliance with the um, open space requirements and indoor uh, recreational requirements. Uh, they they still exceed that. Uh, the uh, overall um, uh, change to the to the amenities that were approved, um, they are eliminating the eliminating the theater room, TV lounge, and chapel. However, um, they are including exercise area, um, the outdoor open space area. Um, they did modify a little bit of the poolside area. They are continuing to provide barber beauty salon computer media room, library, dining area, and wellness center as part of the um, approved amenities. Uh, this is um, also showing what architectural changes resulted from that um, modification. Um, the front of the, uh, of the, the building as viewed from uh, Latham. Uh, there were some changes to the architecture slightly to accommodate additional units um, on the on the lower and second floor levels. So this is a reconfiguration, but very minor um, and consistent with the architectural style of the approval 
um, as approved by commission in June of last year. Uh, this <clears throat> was noticed on December 23rd. Um, the city gave notice in the uh, press enterprise and we mailed out notices to property owners and tenants within 500 feet of holding the public hearing. We um, mailed those out on uh, December 21st. Uh, to date, <clears throat> no correspondence has been received from the public um, on the project. The project is exempt from the Environmental CEQA, um, California Environmental Quality Act um, with the infill CEQA provision uh, 15332, class 32. Um, this item was approved last year and a notice of exemption was filed with the county clerk um, and posted on June 22nd of 2020. It is respectfully requested that the Planning Commission adopt the Planning Commission resolution approving the site development modification uh, subject to the findings and conditions of approval outlined in the staff report. Um, the conditions of approval um, were uh, consistent. There were no additional requirements from the fire department engineering or building. Uh, the Public Works Division did ask to include um, requirements for waste management refuse requirements that were not included prior, as well as wastewater um, division, just wanted to make sure there were some criteria in there to, that they're not, they have to comply with certain uh, requirements. Um, overall, the uh, conditions of approval are consistent with the exception of those um, adjustments. Uh, staff is also requesting that the Planning Commission find that the proposed modification is in substantial conformance with the original approval. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? I do. I have a question. <clears throat> so, Monique, um, looking at the footprint of the new proposed uh, floor plan, so the new footprint does not in any way uh, encroach on the uh, the driveway coming in and the driveway going around the building. That's all as it was before. Yes, that is correct. Okay. All site plan. So here is the uh, the exit the approved building configuration. Um, the, um, this is the proposed configuration, um, which is consistent. Now the proposed uh, shows more detail on the, on the circulation. It does show the drive aisles, uh, whereas the, this plan didn't clearly um, fully identify, but just enough where you can, you can see that, that overall circulation and it is consistent. Uh, it is not in, it's not going to encroach. Is that a moving truck that they've got on that plan there? <laughs> you see that on the bottom? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a moving truck can go through. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Glad to see this um, here. I've been wondering when it was going to be built. Well, I, I'm not sure this might. Is, is the applicant here? Okay, thank, thank you. So I'll I'll, preserve, I'll reserve the question that I have for the applicant. So thank you very much, Monique. And we'll go ahead and uh, open up public hearing. Um, are there any members of the public that would like to comment? Yes, please come on up and uh, state your name and address for the record if you would like. Russell Rumenshaw, uh, 530 St. John Place. Uh, Hemet, uh, representing the uh, owner of the project. Uh, basically, we reviewed the uh, conditions of approval and agree with them. And um, we'd request that you approve the project as uh, recommended by the uh, planning department. I think the reduction in density and I think the opening up of the central courtyard, uh, I think really increased the, uh, the amenities for the project and uh, created just more open space, more air, more circulation. So I think that the change was definitely a benefit for the project. So what was the, what was the driver for, for making these changes? Cost. Cost? Maybe we... In fact, 
Yeah, I think the third, the third wing just required another elevator. It just it created other issues that kind of comp that kind of just kind of multiplied and really the the cost uh, seemed to just get out of control. Uh, amenity area, I think that gives us more flexibility in terms of the amenities that can be provided. Yeah, it seems uh, the, the chapel and the and the the theater. It seems like those are. Would, I, I would I would I would think that would probably be an important element for a a senior community, uh, you know, to 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 have in terms of of whole wellness. Um, was there a was there a kind of cr criteria that was used to what you removed and what you kept? flexible space that could be used for those things if the if the facility warranted it. They, they could have a chapel area or they could have flexible areas in that main in that main space. It just gave us gave us more flexibility rather than designating a specific use for a specific space. Yeah, that makes sense. Any questions or comments for the applicant? No, I have no comments. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Is there anything online submitted e comments or on Zoom? No, there are no e comments submitted. Great, thank you. We'll go ahead and close public hearing. Qu uh, discussion, thoughts? Approving the modifications to the site development. Um, review 20-002, modification one, subject to the conditions of approval in exhibit B and find the proposed modifications are in substantial conformance with the original approval. I'll second. Whoops. Oh, Everybody sorry. make sure they voted. It's it, it. I think it cleared us. Oh, it cleared us. Okay. Motion carries five zero. Thank you. Okay, moving to item six B, conditional use permit twenty one dash zero zero eight for H and H plastics. Carmina. Good evening, Chairman, members of the Blending Commission and public. My name is Mina Morgan, and I'm the project planner for conditional use permit 21-008 for H and H Plastics. The applicant is um, FDC Commercial Construction. The owner is Jose Badrani and Badrani Brother Trust. The project is located at 340 East Menlo Avenue. And the applicant is proposing site improvements and renovation to an existing 15,852 uh, square feet building to be utilized for plastic recycling and processing center, uh, where plastic bottles are cleaned and processing into small pellets for shipping. The hours of operations are eight to five, Monday through Saturday. And the, the applicant will be starting off with a crew of nine employees uh, with a possible future expansion. This project has a general plan land use designation of mixed use. 
and a zoning designation of M1, which is limited manufacturing. Uh, this is an aerial map of the project site, uh, which is currently has a vacant building and surrounded by other uh, commercial facilities and located to the west corner, west, um, southwest corner, excuse me, located to the southwest corner of the project site is another recycling facility. These are some images of the current site condition. Um, the images on the top left is the front of the building, which is accessed from Menlo Avenue. To the image on the right, on the top right, is um, the northeast corner of the property, which is essentially, which will essentially be paved and striped for parking. And lastly, on the bottom is an image of the exterior facade of the building, which is accessed from Menlo Avenue. These are the proposed elevations, um, which, uh, which consist of uh, new exterior building paint with yellow striping, new canvas canopy over second floor windows, the aluminum windows and storefront uh, entrances will be replaced, and the roll-up doors will either be repaired or replaced. Landscaping is proposed throughout the site, um, in the parking lot areas and along the street frontage of Menlo Avenue. Nina, I'm sorry, could you go back to that last slide? What is that, is, what's that area? Make, make sure I don't point my, at myself. I'm sorry, I just can't read, can't read that's, that. That's the end of the paving area. So that's just that's just DG or, or yeah yeah it's going to be essentially used for to trucking to go through and turn around for circulation. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, the site plan is proposing improvements, including paving and restriping of the parking area, landscaping, um, renovation to the trash enclosure. Um, EDA parking and accessible pathway within the site, um, site lighting, and rolling uh, wrought iron gates with a Knox box for fire access. The layout renovation of the um, first floor plan includes lobby, conference room, um, break room, and restrooms. And the upper floor plan renovation will include offices, uh, a bathroom, and an existing balcony. And this is an example of the production line that starts off by purchasing uh, dirty plastic containers from the cer certified recyclers. And then it goes through a specific cleaning process. And finally, the clean containers are grounded down into flakes and stored into bags for shipping upon order. So this is not like a typical um, recycling facility. It's not open to the public. So they, they purchase through uh, licensed recyclers. The project complies with the location of the conditional use permit and consistent with the zoning goals and policy of this chapter, and it will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare to the properties within the vicinity. This project is exempt from the CEQA in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, Section 15301, Class 1A, existing facilities. And the city did give no, uh, public notice by advertising in the press enterprise and by mailing the property owners and tenants within 500 feet regarding the public hearing that is being held today. Um, and staff did not receive any comments regarding this item. And with that, the planning division recommends that the planning commission take the following action, adopt planning commission resolution approving 
CUP 21-008, subject to the condition of approval, and direct staff to file notice of exemption with the county clerk for CEQA purposes. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And we also have the applicant here. Great, thank you. Any questions? I'm kind of curious. Um, you said this is located near a recycling center for that's open to the public. And I don't, uh, the other one. The other yeah. Recycling? Yeah. No, not that I'm aware. I don't think. Oh, it I is. thought there were. I thought you, that's what I thought. But I thought that's what Actually, you said. Actually, there is a recycling center on Menlo, Caddy Corner South, um, across the railroad tracks. Yeah. So next to Arco A and P M. To the east of Arco A and P M, there's a recycling center that is open to the public. So that center would feed this facility. Is that correct? Yeah, he just said yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he just nodded yes. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Other questions? My, I um, is is there a waste stream from the process? And is that waste stream uh, like blow down or, or wash water or whatever is being used, is that being discharged directly into the sewer? Um, engineering did provide a condition of approval for the applicant to provide grading plans to show all that and make sure that it's not going to have overflow. Well, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more interested in, in what's in the waste stream. So whether there is, is, is there a source control monitoring program? I'm, that's, that's what I'm curious about. Is there something, uh, uh, what, what's the, and maybe it's a question when we open up public hearing that, that the applicant can answer, but, but there's, but I, I didn't see anything in the, in the staff report specific to discharges to the wastewater system. And so I'm curious as to what the process, uh, the, manu the, the manufacturing or pelletizing process uh, consists of. Sure, sure. Uh, I think that would be a greater question for our applicant to uh, address. Okay. Any other questions for staff? No. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, open up the public hearing. Uh, if the uh, applicant would not mind coming up and stating name and address, if you would not mind for the record. Uh, good evening, Chairman, Commissioners, and staff. My name is John Dykes. I'm with FTC Commercial. Um, the owner is here as well. He can probably speak more to the process itself. However, I've already been in contact with EMWD regarding concerns like that, and I've had talks with the owner. The process starts as delivery. They take basically plastic bottles, just like the ones that you've got right there. They go through a process of removing the caps, the rings. They wash them just like you would dishes at home, standard detergent. Um, the water that they use, they do have a, a filtration system that they do recycle and reuse the water. Um, and then once that's done, it goes through a drying process, which is just air. And then it goes into a shredding process where it's converted from the plastic into the pellets and flakes that you saw in the image. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so, so the, so the sewer si system is the EMWD and not, and not the city. That is correct. Okay. So that would, that's, that's why it's not in the. In, in the staff report. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? What's your, uh, what's the, what is the schedule, anticipated schedule to have this up and running? Um, we are looking at being in for permits if this is approved tonight uh, by the end of the month. And then it is just a question on how quickly we can get it through the city. Um, I'm anticipating three to five months to get through that. We'll pull permits as they get approved, um, but before the end of the year. Uh, he's got equipment that is being shipped or will be shipped um, from China. Uh, that's where he purchased it all. It's sitting there waiting to be delivered. So after this meeting, I already told him by the end of the month, you can order it. It's going to probably take, I'm figuring with how things are going now, 90 days to get here. And then once wow. it arrives, it'll store on site and then they'll just put it in once we get um, through construction. Not floating out in the harbor for a little while. <laughs> well, <laughs> He normally, he'd said normally it takes about 40 days, but with everything going on, it's probably going to take longer than that. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? I just want to thank you for cleaning up a, a building that is, uh, has really had a lot of challenges. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. All right. Thank you so much.
Any other people that would, or anyone else that would like to comment on this? Please. And if you don't mind, state your name and address for the record. Javier Lopez, and I'm the executive director of Valley Restart Shelter, which is next door to this uh, building. And, you know, when I, when I saw the notice, that's why I'm here, because um, when I saw that possibility, I'm thinking of helping the homeless folks, families that are living and residing at our shelter as a possible em site, you know, uh, employer for them to, to get back on their feet, because that's our whole purpose, to get families back into society, if you will. And so I think there's a lot of uh, great potential here uh, for, for not only for the city in general, but for the folks, like I mentioned, the folks that are living just next door and they would be walking distance. And, and I'm going to hopefully speak to the, these guys because <laughs> right now, you know, before I leave, but, um, but that's why I'm here because, uh, you know, we see a lot of homeless in the streets that are invading basically that building on a daily basis and it would be nice to clean them up and, and then bring them either to recite at our shelter or um, and hopefully get them employed and you know and back back to work so thank you great thank you so much for for taking the time to come down and speak to this outstanding anyone else any e comments or anybody on zoom we do have two people in Zoom. Let me just double check with them. Uh, if anyone in the Zoom teleconference would like to make a comment on this, please indicate so by hitting the raise hand icon. No, I don't believe there's any comments on this particular item at this time. All right, thank you, Ms. Me. Uh, we'll go ahead and close public hearing. Discussion, thoughts? No, I'm, it's great. I think it's yeah, it cleaned yeah. up. It's wonderful. Motion. I'd like to make a motion to that uh, Planning Commission dot resolution CUP 21-008 subject to conditions of approval and direct staff to file notice of exemption with the county clerk for CEQA purposes. I'll second. The motion carries 5-0. Uh, thank you and welcome. All right, uh, moving on to item 6C, general plan amendment 21-001 for housing element. Monique. Chairman, members of the planning commission and the community, I'm Monique Allen East Slater. Um, tonight um, is a city initiated proposal um, for the recommended adoption to revise our city's housing element of the Hemet general plan, updating the current housing element in accordance with state mandated requirements for the 2021 to 2029 six housing element cycle. Uh, for the uh, last year, the city has worked alongside with our consulting team, uh, the community planning commission and city council uh, to prepare the draft general plan housing element update. Uh, we're work, we've been committed to working with um, the state HCD to achieve a final legally compliant uh, adopted housing element. Um, this evening, our consulting firm, uh, Dave Barquist with Kimley Horn, is here to uh, present the proposal uh, for recommendation to the city council further. Thank you. was made an entrance by uh, falling forward on that. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, time this evening. We have a brief uh, presentation for you, uh, which essentially is uh, giving a, a thumbnail summary of this nice uh, quality long document that I'm sure each of you has read in, in, uh, in its entirety. Uh, if you had insomnia, it's a great cure. I guarantee you for that. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, Kidding aside, what we want to do today as far as uh, giving an overview of the update process, uh, talk about the candidate sites and housing strategies and the importance of that in the planning process, uh, overview, generally speaking, the goals, policies, objectives, which is really the foundation of your of the policy program, if you will. Uh, the process of reviewing with the state 
and the feedback that they have given the state and how you as a as an agency uh, and a body will respond to those comments from the state and then uh, some overview of the the next steps in the uh, planning process. So as far as the uh, housing element itself, about every eight years, this process goes on in the state and uh, it's changing over the course of the last few years, but essentially as the regions go through the regional transportation process, we in the process is a, is a adjunct to that process as well. Uh, the process uh, engages your community in developing the identification of issues and policies and programs, and you've been experienced that in the few meetings we've already had. Uh, stakeholders as well, so people with a vested interest like the gentleman you just spoke from uh, serving the homeless, those are the types of uh, folks the housing element would like to address. Really what the element itself does is it demonstrates the capacity or your ability uh, to accommodate future housing needs, uh, but also the existing needs of your existing community. So it's a growth need and the inherent need of what your existing population uh, has. It also establishes goals, policies, objective and actions to be Adopt, uh, adopted and implemented over the next eight year planning cycle, in this case, 2021 to 2029. What's unique about this is it's the only element within the general plan that requires certification by the state of California. So it literally goes up to Sacramento. Uh, they review it for a whole host of uh, compliance issues with statutory provisions. And if you're familiar with uh, recent uh, trends. There's a lot of new laws that relate to this. I think we're over 100 now from since 2017, and that probably trend will probably continue, most recently with SB9, SB10 that you may be familiar with. In terms of the components of the housing element, the, the main uh, component of this is the first four sections. Uh, the uh, section two and three form the foundation of analysis when we look at population, housing, uh, the um, profile of your community, if you will. Then we look at constraints, uh, resources to address those constraints, and those are in section two and three. We consider some of the outreach that occurs in the process as well to get us to the point where we can start adopting those policies and programs, or I should say develop those in section four. So section four is really that articulation of here's the things that we're going to do, here's the ways and means that we're going to get there. Uh, the document itself is supplemented by a number of appendices. Appendix A is reviewing your current housing element or your adopted as of today, the fifth cycle as we call it. Uh, this is your sixth cycle coming up. We look at your existing policy and say where you've done well, where you may have had some challenges and learn those lessons. Hindsight is 2020, so to speak. Uh, the Appendix B is the analysis of uh, an identification of sites to accommodate our future growth need. And we'll talk about the arena need in just a moment. So it's a detailed evaluation of the resources of land that you have available to accommodate your future growth need. Uh, then we have a summary of the community outreach uh, that you had through the process. We'll detail here in a moment, uh, which is really how does that affect influence and or um, provide influence to the development of policies and programs. And so it's uh, really a celebration of the input that your community has, and it's a way for your public to see that they've had an integral part in the planning process. Oh, excuse me, let me go back there. Uh, and then finally, just a, a glossary of housing terms. We use a lot of acronyms uh, in the document, and it's just a way for people who haven't been familiar with that to, uh, to um, get familiar with those those words and different uh, terms that we use. <clears throat> in terms of the outreach process, there was a few virtual, wor virtual workshops that were done. And obviously in the COVID environment, uh, it was difficult to have in-person engagement, but we did find that there was participation by the community uh, within the virtual community workshop, much like the, uh, uh, the process you have today for your planning commission. In April and October, those workshops occurred uh, getting feedback, providing information to the public. There were two joint study sessions with this body and the city council uh, in June and November of this year. 
uh, public uh, review is available from September through October, end of October, and it provided a form and a method for people to provide comment back. So it just it wasn't put on the website, but a, an actual form enabled people to make comments on the plan and provide feedback uh, to staff for the document. Uh, there was a project website, the review draft, background information, all of that was provided uh, for the for the uh, community to uh, be well uh, aware of what was happening. So in terms of the candidate housing sites and strategies, one of the major components of the housing element is to identify the ability to accommodate future growth needs. So for the next eight year planning period, the city has allocated a, an estimated growth need. We must demonstrate that the sites that we have can accommodate that. And if they don't, what rezone strategies that we'll employ to make that um, make that the case. <clears throat> so the uh, housing element itself identifies candidate sites for the 20, 2021 to 2029 planning period. And that is really growth needs. So think of new rooftops or new doorknobs, if you will, in your community through that planning period. So it means within that planning period, those are the sites that will be accommodated uh, in, in your community. So the anticipation is the numbers that will look like in a moment, the sites will accommodate that over the next eight year planning period. So the sites that we've uh, proposed uh, are really focused on areas that you have existing policy for, therefore existing infrastructure, existing resources, uh, amenities, among other things, and transportation were considerations for their sites. So uh, we're not saying just a random site in some random place, but these are places that have all the ingredients, if you will, to be successful candidates for residential development. And so if you look at that strategy, the last bullet point there, it talks about uh, projected accessory dwelling units. We can count by state law an assumption of what accessory dwelling units with all the new ADU laws that have come out. There's a methodology that the state and SCAG, Southern California Association, allows us to use to estimate the impacts of these new laws. So we look at recent past performance and project that out over the planning period. You'll see the numbers aren't huge, but they're at least a contributing factor to that. And we have existing vacant residentially zoned properties within your community with existing zoning that would accommodate that. And then we want to have a buffer of the sites because what the issue we have here is what we call no net loss. And what happens is you have to identify sites by income category now in the law. And if you use a siting you don't fit within that income category, you have to identify additional sites you have available to accommodate what you have not un unaccommodated. So for example, a site we say, this is all going to be 100 units of very low income and it comes in the market rate. Well, we need to demonstrate that we do have sites available somewhere else to accommodate that very low income need. That's why there's a buffer in that. Yes, you have a question. Question regarding that, those numbers. And that is something that down through the years, the city of Hemet has argued so many times. Right now, because the, the prices of housing <clears throat> and the prices of rentals have gone up exponentially in comparison to any time I think we all have seen in the Valley and in the city of Hemet. So, but we're still, it, it, relatively speaking, uh, for our surrounding area, we're still very low as, as far as pricing. So when we look at income and we look at what's affordable, it's generally cities like city of Hemet, San Jacinto, um, and kind of our, our neighbors that are far lower than the rest. So when you're talking about the income consideration, how, how does that balance out for all, all the other cities that are fairly close to Temecula and Marietta, let's say, for example, are quite a bit higher in price. Um, and they are also show a higher higher level of income. Do we get extra points for that because we <laughs> provide so many more affordable houses for that? Or do they take that away from us? Well, you, you asked some some uh, some doozies in there, but I can tell you this, the <laughs> the uh, the county median income is the statutorily the driver. 
So we look at all the cities within the county that you reside, that median income is across the entire county. So when we look at, I don't I think I have the number here offhand, but uh, we can probably look it up for you. Uh, all cities within the, within the, the region, within the county, uh, apply to that, that um, median family income. So you'll have some jurisdictions that have higher, uh, locally higher incomes and some that have locally lower incomes. But the average across the whole county is what the, the barometer that we use to do that. That being said, there are circumstances where we look at the, the local conditions for affordability, among other things that influence the market and uh, affordability rents and other things. So that is detailed in, in detail in section two and three to provide you with that. So you can see what the actual incomes in the community are as it compares to the county and the differences between that. When it comes to the RENA numbers, it's going to be based on the affordability is going to be based on the county, uh, the county's income. That's just part of statutory requirements. <clears throat> so what's the median income for each one of these columns? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get in, into what those mean okay. as I go through All the right. table. Would you like me to go through that right now? No, that's okay. I'll, I'll wait. Oh, no, I was, well, I'm ready so, to go through it now if you don't have any more questions. Well, I, I just want to follow up on um, um, Commissioner Van Arsdale's point so does that so the median income is set by the county um and so you know city of hammett being generally lower lower values than say the city of temecula or 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 uh murrieta do we have an easier time meeting rena numbers versus those because we have lower priced housing is that what or is that a direct correlation Oh, well, well, we'll say there's a correlation, in, and it's a, a reasonable assumption that you just said, that if you have overall uh, within your community an average lower price point, then that's going to be a benefit to you as, because you're going to be shifted to the, uh, you know, to the left of that affordability stretch uh, more than somebody like, a, you know, a, a more um, newer or say a wealthier city, if you will. But the proportional share of their allocation a very low low is consistent or, or this, is a, this is a question is, is it consistent between the different cities so 10 percent here 10 percent over in the city of Marietta so if it's so just because we have a lower in uh, lower price point it doesn't mean that we have to doesn't mean that we have to take on a little higher burden than say someone than say the city of Marietta yeah, and then you'll see in the methodology, we can probably spend two hearings just to talk about the methodology that they use. Uh, but those are considerations in other economic and uh, drivers, birth and death rates and, and job opportunities, transportation issues are all going to influence the where those numbers actually landed. And then there's also politicking that goes with that and it's changed that. And there, there was some of that during this round as well. You know, those what you're talking about is probably true, but look at the numbers in the low income area. They're still very high. No matter where you're at. Sorry. Go ahead and continue. Thank you. And that point being is as we will shift into this table, as you see here is you see the numbers as relatively high, as you said. If we compare that to the fifth cycle, uh, in many cases, it's profoundly higher. It's 1.3 million of growth need in the SCAG region, broken down by all the um, all the cities within that. So that's a significant amount of growth. And what the uh, governor had said is a, is a stretch goal, is I think the term that he used. And so you're seeing the trend in all the jurisdictions, and you're not excluded. Uh, everybody has been witness to this, is you're seeing a higher number in terms of your arena number. And depending on the geography, for example, a lot of the lower income was shifted towards the coast, if you will. And some of the, uh, because before the argument was you're getting the inland uh, areas, we're getting the burning of that. And so you're seeing some shift in that. And so that's what you see. If you look at the totality of the arena numbers, you'll see this a profound shift. But let me walk you through the table that you see here is, it's based on the arena allocation is based on the um, median family income of the county. 
and I believe it's somewhere around 72,000. I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but staff can correct me if they, if they, they want to, um, <coughs> excuse me. And the pie, slice of the pie that you have is basically, oh, there they go. The slice of the pie that you have is by income category. And those are based on a percentage of that median income. So for example, very low income is up to 50% of the median income. Low income is uh, 51 to 80% of that. Moderate income is 81 to 120% of that. And above moderate income is greater than 120%. So if we look at the table, if we put a, a line down the middle there between the low and moderate, everything to the right of it is it's generally what you would say market rate units. And everything to the left of that would be those units that may be some level of assistance or help, if you will, to bring it to market just because of the, of the uh, affordability uh, requirements to meet it. So you see here the RENA 2021 to 2029, those are the amount of units that are anticipated of growth need in your community over the next eight years. So you have to demonstrate the ability of sites to accommodate that growth need. It doesn't mean that you as a city have to build those directly, you're not a builder, but you provide the policy and regulatory provisions to allow the market to do it for themselves. So that's your role and the policies is, is to do that. Uh, market conditions and other circumstances will influence the timing and, and what happens over the, the planning period. So we have to demonstrate, go ahead, please. I want to, just for clarification, when you say, for an example, 8,817 8, units total, and then you're, you're basing it on percentage of, based on income. And so when we go back to like Marietta, when we refer to Marietta, Marietta is obviously a higher income city. So obviously they're going to have more moderate or above moderate homes numbers, correct? Not as many low income or very low income. I'm a little confused on that because we're basing it on the income. Not necessarily. Like I said, the model that is developed for the uh, regional housing needs allocation, it's not a straight line model. And you'll have to, we can provide you with the details if you'd like, but I, I warn you, it's pretty, uh, some pretty uh, wicked stuff. But we, those are considerations. So when you look at other, th other factors, other than just a percentage of affordability breakdown, those are influenced by, for example, uh, when you have an area that doesn't have any transportation access, it's going to be much more difficult to provide the opportunities for lower incomes because they may not have access to transportation or services and things that are, we'll say out in the hinterlands, uh, may be much of a challenge to do affordable than there would be something for uh, market rate units. So those are all considerations that go in there. If you look across all the cities and the jurisdictions and the state, it's all over the place. And you're, you're going to see that because all the inputs to the models, there's so many variables in that. It, that's what influences those numbers. So because we are a lower income town compared to Menifee, we will have to cater more for the low income and, and continue to keep welcoming that instead of the above income based on income. That, that's why I'm a little confused on because if, if Menifee, for an example, is a higher income bracket city, uh, they're not, and they don't have to acquire as many very low incomes, but we being a lower income city have to acquire many lower incomes. that will just continue to keep building. And it'll just, to me, it would just uh, in a way ruin the city if we continue to expand to lower incomes year after year after year because of income. The intent of the RENA process is to rectify the issue that you just stated, is to provide a greater level of balance and equity, if you will, across those affordabilities. Well, what they don't want is to be have dumping grounds of uh, different affordabilities in different places. What they want is to provide a more equitable distribution in the cases where you have the current resource and other things that may influence, you know, in that spectrum where they'd be more appropriate. So for example, in a downtown area where all the services are, you may have a higher propensity for affordable units because the, the, the math works in those areas better than it does somewhere that's, you know, say in a new community out in the desert, for example. When you have, when you have a, 
well, him at 2019, I know it's changed a little bit, but 2019, uh, for the rest of the region, Hemet had almost 13%, 12.9% unemployment. Our neighbors, San Jacinto had 9.2, Menifee 7.3, Paris 7.4, Riverside County 7.5. So, so we have that kind of problem we have to address. And along um, what you're talking about with the in income levels, then Again, I, I always, and you've heard me before, I've griped about RENA and RENA requirements um, uh, at the other meetings. The, the amount that they take, at the amount of consideration they give to things like this, uh, as far as RENA goes, do you know on our unemployment levels, uh, the conditions of why we have that high of unemployment and compared to our neighbors? Do they take that into consideration? That, that is one of the factors that, that looks at the influencing factors in the methodology that was used to develop RENA. Shall I go through and uh, walk through the table so you can get an understanding of, of where you're at? So I'm going to walk through the, the layers of the cake here, starting from the RENA on the top. That's 6,400 uh, some odd units or your growth need over the next eight years. You have to demonstrate the I have the sites available to accommodate that. So when we look at current projects, what we call in the public, uh, in the pipeline projects, such as the one that you just saw with the CUPs, uh, that would be considered a, in the pipeline project. And we want to identify all of those things that have entitlements or uh, uh, ability that we can make a, a general assumption that they will develop within the planning period. So you see here on that column, a number of units that are through there, pretty significant numbers, especially on the lower income part of the spectrum. So uh, you pat yourself on the back as a community to see those numbers in comparison to your peers. So when we look at sites, we have to also look at, so we, we net those numbers out, what we just talked about the in the pipeline project. Those are in the bag, so to speak. Then we have the existing vacant residentially zoned property. So land that exists today that has policy and, and zoning requirements to it that is vacant and available for development. And those are the yields of those units by those income categories that we assume. And then you see the accessory dwelling units that we talked about. We have a methodology that is approved by the state that we can slice them into the different income categories as the percent breakdown that they allow us to do to make those assumptions. So educated guess, if you will. Then you have the capacity of all of that in the yellow there. Note that you have a surplus of sites. This is the idea with the, um, the no net loss provision. So if we didn't have a, a surplus of sites, if a project came in and then we couldn't demonstrate sites to accommodate what we have remaining, we have 180 days to do a rezone program. So this, what this does to you as a body is it restricts or prevents uh, ad hoc zoning time and time again. So every project would come in, you'd have to do that. So it'd be a 180 day whistle that you'd have to do these rezones. So the, the idea with the, um, the, um, uh, buffer is to avoid that over the course of the planning period. And you can see the percentages over of that is to accommodate those considerations. So you can see here a map on the- on I'm the sorry, site. could you go back yeah. real quick one, one slide? And I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask a kind of a dumb question, but um, that total number is 64, 66, is that, is that, and that's a number developed by the state that is basically a planning projection of, of what they anticipate the city of Hemet is going to, uh, uh, growth need, well, growth need or growth projection. I mean, what's, what's the different, I mean, there, there, there's a difference there, right? I mean, is, is that, is that the state is saying, this you have you have a need to accept this this many residences regardless of if there's a trend of people wanting to move to the city or, or yeah, let me let me rewind back to what you said of the state so the state allocates assumptions of growth to each of the mpos in this case skag 
and they say, Skag, you have 1.3 million of growth need over the next eight years. You, Skag, develop a methodology that slices those into their component pie slices by your jurisdictions within that. So it's Skag's responsibility to develop the methodology and the final allocations with the 6466. So this was a process went through there was a, a appeal process a number of cities have gone through that and there were some revisions and other things that were done so that is done at the we'll say that at the local level um, in terms of the actual number in uh, uh, can I ask you what was the next part of your question so on then how how is the um, the ratio distributed or or, or or how are those alloc how is that 64 66 then allocated to all the different cat categories and that's what you're referring to in regards to the services we have um you know so so the city of him i'm not sure what those percentages are what very low income what percentage that is of the 64 66 but let's just for for grin say it's 12 percent um what it, is it safe to say that the surrounding cities would have a comparable um disbursement or, or of of their total rena numbers within those different categories i would say comparable but i wouldn't certify that as being true um, when we look at those those numbers are going to be flexible depending on like those all those variables so there's a helter skelter of that and there is some uh, fontana's numbers are sixteen thousand. Um, also, can I just interject? Uh, they, these number. This is not um, us having to make sure someone builds this. It is only for zoning, so that if developers want to come in, we can show that we have the opportunity for them to have the project. It's not right. at any one point in time that we have to have that many houses for, you know, this this city before twenty twenty nine, right? It's that it, we have to have the land available for developers, if they wish, to come in and create those. The, the overall goal of the process is that that's your need that's been identified. So conceivably, at the end of the eight years, that would be the growth that you have in your community. So per unit that they project, uh, so for every housing unit, how many people do they consider in these numbers? I don't think I ran across that. A uh, person's per household? Uh, that's based on, uh, we use the, uh, the uh, Department of Finance DOF numbers that come out and it changes every year. Uh, we can get the person per households and say, it may range say three, 3.1, 3, 3 two, depending on the jurisdiction. Some are very high, like say Santa Ana might be, you know, 4.2, whereas Menifee might point might be a 2.7 so it varies uh, that has changed every to three every well, we we can do that it is in the housing element we can pull it up for you to, to get. Uh, but I, I think the point there is that that or, or at least the point that I take from that is that we're making an assumption based on these arena numbers and allocation from SCAG that the 64 66 is going to result in, in the next eight years we're going to have a population increase in him at about 20,000 people <laughs> Plus or minus, <laughs> right. Right. But, but and and I, I mean, if you go back eight years, I mean, that's so those are those are pretty um, optimistic, right? Growth projections in terms of population, but the de the delineation of or, or, or the 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 breakdown of how that's allocated is causing us to make changes in our zoning, and and if we if we don't get the twenty nineteen thousand. 398 um, uh, folks, we end up maybe getting more of just a, you know, more on the left end of, of, of that, or, you know, maybe half of that, but it just ends up being more of the low income because we've made the zoning changes to allocate to, to make it available for, for those types of developments to, to um, come online. I guess, I guess it's just, I mean, what I'm, when I'm, what I'm, it, it, from from a master planning or projection perspective, where it, it how does this align with say the city's projected population increase? Do we have anything internally that is that 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 is consistent with this? You mean modeled? Pardon me. A model. Well, just I mean I I know I know 
you know, on water and sewer, we, we, yeah. we plan based on projected developments and, and water needs and sewer needs and everything else. Do, is the arena the basis for the city's planning? This re- arena is essentially a projection. And that methodology is used statutorily by law. That is the number that is certified as that need for the planning period. So in other words, uh, Hemet's stuck with that number. It won't flex over the course of the planning period. What may influence is, is market conditions and other things that we have that are out of our control, uh, such as remember 91, 92 when the market crashed, we, we couldn't control that. And then, you know, especially in this region, it just construction shuttered for a number of years. Well, that, that could happen uh, or it could have the opposite effect and, you know, and, and increase, but we don't know that. What we have to do is say, our assumption of the 64 units of growth need is what we're planning for. And it will have over the next year, we'll get another seven cycle and the eight cycle and do the same process over and over. You know what I'm worried about is that surplus. If that number goes up to Sacramento, that surplus, and there's an adjacent city that's got a shortfall. Oh, some propeller head up in Sacramento is going to sit there and go, Oh, you know what? Hemet's got a surplus. Let's move some of those low income numbers over to uh, Hemet. I, I would, I would keep. Yeah. You, your, your elected officials have to be on their toes to, to rant and rave over that. I, I would try to keep that surplus down to a minimum percentage. I mean, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Well, you also have to be able to serve the people that are here. And the thing is, is we have six high schools, which means we have young families, we have seniors, those people aren't, you know, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is, and, and look at your above moderate income is plus 53%. So what we have, uh, we we're projecting a surplus. Why do we have to project so much Well, all I'm keep to keep the, keep the excess in, in your hip pocket? I mean, don't publish that to Sacramento. I, I, they're the ones that publish this, right? They're the ones that record. No, this, these are our numbers going to Sacramento, right? The surplus? Yeah, this are, is it the, your planning assumptions. I'm telling you, you, you start putting numbers out like that, we're going to get whacked. One other thing that we're, we're oh, you just mentioned high school. Out of that 19,938 people, uh, probably about a third are children that need to have schools. That's 6,000, about 6,500 kids, which means most schools are about 800, 800. So that's seven to eight new, um, new, new schools, period. Whether they push into the ones that are there or you have to build new. Um, as we make these plans for these new housing areas, we have to con- consider, excuse me, um, we have to consider the fact that those, that planning needs to be integrated with the school district's planning. And oftentimes it's not. And that is one mistake I can say that we made back in the day. I think that all councils and school districts just kind of start going on their own, getting the things done that they're required to get done. And there's not an integration of the the planning with the with the schools too. You're saying add that to the model of the projection, well, the schools. I, I I think that the school district. Uh, I know that the school district. Gave up, remember, not too long ago, they gave up a site that we had approved the housing out area out at, and there was a site reserved for the school district, and this and in the city too. And and we had been asked to. Um, but yeah. approve that that school district, that school site being thrown out and houses being built on it. Yeah. Because at the moment, the school doesn't need it. They'd had a contraction of, of their number of students. Mm-hmm. They, you know, what this market's going to do. And if it continues, we'll see this rush to build. But, but this amount of, of, people it, well, it needs to include an element of planning for the the little people who need the education that, you bring up a good point and that is 
has anybody done a model that shows the layout of the city and the zoning to meet this this projection so that we could see is there enough land associated or set aside for schools and other things as we grow has, has that happened uh, yes commissioner dana Hill, um, let me address that and uh, dave can jump in um, to make any corrections that i i might say um, the projections that you see there are from SCAC, and we have our numbers which are in yellow based on our current zoning and current land that is available mm -hmm. so when you talk about a model our zoning map actually is the model right that we set out to say that this area can handle this many units and so on. So the zoning map in itself is a model and general plan in itself is a model of how the city council sees the city develop in the future. So the numbers up there is not something that we can just hide and hold the numbers on the side. It's what we have in our zoning map and general plan map. So that's what we're basically analyzing. So it's not that we are we can not include certain parcels. It's just what's available now and what the potential is for the next eight years. Well, I know what you're talking about, but I mean, in your model, you got to be saying, well, in this zoning area, this size houses could go here, these size houses could go there. I mean, you could play with the numbers, I'm sure. But as uh, we have discussed, the city does not build any homes. I know that. So I, 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 say, I got that. Say uh, a, a area A, uh, we allocate 400 number of units. But somebody comes in and says, hey, you know what? I want to do single family, high end income. So I'm only going to build 50. That means you have to reallocate that 50 missing units somewhere else. Without the surplus or without the extra component, extra numbers, we can't mm -hmm. reallocate that. That means we have to go back and rezone certain areas to make sure that that number meets the 6466. Yeah, but do you really think someone in Sacramento is going to look at our zoning map and look at these numbers and say, oh, you're off? I mean, do we have to publish such a surplus? We have to. Do you, you understand what I'm getting to, right? I understand. I don't trust these politicians up there. I understand, but we have to show our numbers in true form. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with... Uh, 5% surplus versus 11% for the low income. I think, I think, I, th I think that, the, you know, it, it, when you submit anything. I mean, you're, you're given state, a number of dwellings. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it is based on, you know, uh, uh, residences per, per acre. And, and those, those numbers are set per our, 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 our zoning map. Well, um, there's, I, I, I would, I, I think, I, and, I would challenge that. Well, but. There's probably a million. There's probably a million comp computations to that zoning map for those numbers. If you if you did a Monte Carlo analysis, you'd probably come up with over a million uh, scenarios. Well, I, I can't speak to that. I one 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 question um, that I do have, just kind of historically, how have we? Um, tracked with previous cycles relative to rena numbers have we been historically above or below what skag has said the housing need has been so i could comment a little bit on that but dave can comment overall on all the um, regions that he has studied but uh, my understanding is that very few cities have ever met those rena numbers in the past uh, that's directly because city does not build any homes. Uh, we're just waiting for builders to come and build in those areas that we have allocated for a different range of units. So a lot of the cities can't meet that because the developers only come or builders don't, will only come if they can make money. So if their numbers don't pencil out, then no matter what the city provides, they're not going to come and build. You know what is a little a little interesting to me with my other my other hat right now is we base from developing water and wastewater and things of that nature those projects take a really long time and we base planning and and funding and construction of you know 100 million dollar wastewater treatment plants 
based on these types of numbers because it takes five years to build and it's interesting that these numbers we seem we're consistently lower than what those numbers are so we're over projecting or over optimistically projecting what the needs are and thereby investing perhaps a more uh, in in systems than we you know may actually uh, need but um, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and ask if, if you don't mind just to, let's go ahead and continue on and get through this a little bit and well I'm sure there'll be more opportunities for I'll be as, uh, as efficient as I can. These are just the location of those sites. And what's important to note is that there isn't over concentrations of affordabilities in certain areas of the city. Obviously, in the areas such as within this area, there's greater opportunity for uh, greatest connection to services, among other things. But generally speaking, it's spread out uh, geographically throughout the, throughout the community. Uh, the goals and policies and, and programs within the, the plan itself are highlighted, and these are just the overarching goals. So if you think of the umbrella policy direction setting goals, they're implemented through program actions and policies. Uh, but essentially, the, the goals, and I'll just summarize these, the first one is about quality of the housing, the second one about affordable housing improvement and provision of that. Uh, the third one being about adequate sites to accommodate your growth needs. Uh, and then the fourth one is related to existing neighborhood preservation and the quality of your neighborhoods. And the final one is uh, housing opportunities for affordable within your community. So then you'll have a series of uh, programs and actions that are associated with the, those silos of, of goals that you have in the plan. Uh, section four is what talks about what those are. Uh, it's in, in great detail. Many of the uh, programs and policies relate to new statutory requirements. And uh, there is a lot of reference to government code sections, among other things, is what HCD likes to hear, the state likes to hear to say is, we will comply with this law that already exists. So there's some um, a lot of repetition, if you will, on some of the policies. So here are some of those new policy programs. We talk about accessory dwelling units, junior accessory dwelling units, which are in consideration with new laws, development of objective de development standards. When we have projects come in, we don't have a subjected method to approve them. They're all equally applied. There's streamlining provisions through SB 35 that relates to your course of performance of your arena obligations over the planning period. Uh, emergency shelters, transitional housing, and supportive uh, housing, as well as a new requirement for low barrier navigation, which is essentially wraparound services for uh, uh, persons in need of uh, short, short and longer term um, housing, and developmental disabilities, as well as persons with uh, physical disabilities in your community. Uh, new requirements of the law related to farm worker housing. Um, at-risk units and preservation and monitoring of that uh, mobile home park preservation as uh, the community has a higher um, incidence of uh, mobile homes. So uh, there's some program support for that. Uh, removal of developmental constraints and fair housing, which we call affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is a whole new requiring the law, significant influencing factor policies and programs that we see over the course of the six cycles. So we have a draft document that um, was developed through consultation with staff and getting all this data. It was sent up to the state for their review. Uh, the city on December 23rd uh, of this uh, past year uh, got the comments from the state, which is uh, right before the holiday break. So uh, it made it perfect for us is they review the housing elements and in your packet, uh, it, you do have the letter. Um, it's a, it's a somewhat of a interesting read to go through it, but essentially the state says, we review your housing elements uh, and identify those elements that will get you in compliance with state law. So what they look at is really here's the analysis, the additional information necessary for us to make a finding of substantial compliance with statutory provisions. 
And so that's a subjective kind of a statement. So you'll see some of the comments in the letter, uh, if you've read it, uh, are related to things, what I call more frosting on the cake type of comments. So in effect, it is saying to give us a way to press a button to say, yes, you comply, give us some more narrative and storytelling. So the comments that you see and the changes that will occur in the document uh, haven't been completed yet, but they will be completed only to the extent that they comply with what the state law requires us to do. So from a, a subjective or a um, preferential kind of policy program changes, that won't change the spirit and intent of what you see in this document, only as much as it uh, allows the state to say you comply with statutory requirements. And I'll give you some brief examples that you see here. In the exist, existing policy program, it's narrative to say, well, how does your past performance relate to uh, your special needs populations? And how does that collectively influence positively the helping those, uh, you know, your population? So there's a narrative and storytelling about that. Uh, housing conditions, describing that in a little more detail. Uh, some of firmly furling fair housing, that's a mouthful, I know, AFFH is what we call it. It's updating maps and tables and additional analysis. So the, the story is still there, the storyline is still the same, just some additional maps to uh, further enhance that. Uh, com, com, uh, governmental constraints relate to land use controls, uh, the policies programs. Uh, one thing is there about parking, local ordinances such as inclusionary policy that may influence that. They just wanna see that. If it doesn't exist, we just make a statement in there that it doesn't exist and therefore it may not make a, um, an impact to that. Uh, look at the justification of the sites when you tell the story about, we have these sites available, larger sites, for example, tell us your history of where you've done that in the past. It gives us the warm and fuzzies to say that you could do it in the future. So again, it's that narrative. Uh, the housing program changes are only related to uh, the comment simply staying is, we want you to affect most of your change as early as you can in the plat, uh, planning period so you have that whole eight years to implement it. So there's a number of programs that may say ongoing uh, that may need to be evaluated. So they may have some modifications, say ongoing with annual review for uh, effectiveness. If something uh, we identify some deficiencies, we'll make subsequent changes in the policy. So. In a nutshell, that's what the, the HCD letter from December uh, 23rd uh, says. We are actively going through and making those changes right now. Yes. Is there a deadline for that revision back to the state? There is no deadline. Uh, the only deadline is when we give it back to them, they have a time period that they have to comply with. Uh, it was 60 days as of uh, December 31st. There was a new state law signed by the governor in October that changed that to 90 days as of December or January 1st of this year. So yeah, <laughs> they're, they're overwhelmed to say the least uh, at the state. And that was a, a precipice to that. Uh, as far as the next step, uh, we had the letter from HCD, uh, your consideration and comments and recommendations uh, for approval. That will go to the city council if you so chose to uh, make a recommendation this evening, uh, would go to the state uh, subsequent to that for a final certification review. In the instance where some policies or programs that may change that may be different from that, uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, there may be a possibility that it com could be come back as an amendment uh, to the housing element based on some state comments if that were the case. Uh, if that is the case and that applies based on consultation with your uh, city attorney, uh, there may be a subsequent um, recommendation that you would make to council at a later date. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions for you. So I'd, I'd like to, um, so just so I can kind of be clear from a, from a top, from a top down perspective. So state comes in and says, Hey, we have a certain number of housing needs statewide. SCAD comes in and says, well, we're going to take that housing need, how about EDUs, RDUs, I'm not sure what the term is, but 
um, there's a population increase of X number and, and, and we're going to distribute it to the different um, land use agencies, or the different cities. And then, and then um, there is a model that says um, within that number of the 6,700 or whatever that was, um, so much has to be uh, low income and, and so on and so forth. So the things that we as a city have an op, the, the points that the city has an opportunity to impact, it, it really is um, in how we implement our zoning, our policies, our ordinances, the, the, the different things in, 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 in compliance with state law that allow us to manage what the state requirements are in terms of accepting new development, right? Is that a, is, is that a fair way to say that? So our housing element update is basically saying, how can we best as a city manage what is being put upon us from, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the state? Just one area that, that is kind of interesting is to, to, to me working and planning on water side of things is, is it, if we are consistently over planning or over projecting um, year after year after year. And I think this last couple of years was the first time that the state of California had like a net loss in terms of population is how, how do, do we ever go back or is there an entity that goes back and kind of like, like calibrates what those arena numbers are to be more in line with what the actual um, not only on a statewide level, but then on a regional level within the states. Okay, well, people are moving out of LA and they're moving out to the Inland Empire because they don't like, you know, all the lockdowns and everything. Is there how how is there any calibration that is being done at the state or SCAG level to say, hey, th those numbers are over optimistic. They're not accurate. They're consistently not accurate. You're over projecting. And as a result of that is you're making us show things and do things in terms of managing something that we that's not necessarily going to transpire. Does that, does that make sense? Simple answer that is no, that process hasn't happened. So going back to what Commissioner Van Arsdale was talking about in terms of um, um, aligning and coordinating with the other entities the school district the water and wastewater agencies the transportation the folks that the other entities that are support you know that that sure seems like a, a huge area of an opportunity for improvement to be a little bit smarter and more um more predictive i guess in 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 in, in, in how we do this um i don't know it, it it's it one of the reasons I got on the planning commission was I wanted to learn more about the, the, the earlier in the process. And it's interesting. It's, it's a little scary, actually. And a lot of this is 2019 data, too. I mean, there's a lot has changed in 2020 and 2021, especially like what you're referring to, people exiting the state. You know, they're just California and New York have some of the highest percentage of people leaving the state. And yeah. so, I mean, but we're using data from 2019. And there's been a lot that's happened in the last two years yeah. due to the pandemic. Yeah. We lost the Congress, congressional district. That's a uh, half a million people generally when you average it out. But uh, I guess they don't take that into consideration because we're working off of those, the, the census numbers that came in or the 2019 numbers before the census was done. Conceivably, you know, hindsight is the you look at it in the future and, and subsequent changes and subsequent rena processes will consider those changes but as we have it there the 6400 units that's that's the bag that we're holding we have to accommodate for that and unless the legislature changes that or some new uh, initiative changes that uh, that's going to be the case from here on out somewhere in one of our meetings but i will repeat repeated that there was a time when they were requiring us 11,000 units. Uh, that was many years ago and we fought like crazy about that. But uh, so at least this is 5,000 less or so. It's just yeah. sure seems like there'd be a 
should should be a process of calibration if if you continually project the the wrong stuff you should probably realign how you're projecting so it's you're, that, in, you're anticipating sacramento being on the ball <laughs> no no not at all, not at all just yeah. op optimistic but, okay but like i said it's to me what's interesting is how all of these things are trickling down to all of the other uh, school districts and and water districts and wastewater districts and stormwater districts and everyone else that that are using these projections to do to plan their their budgets and their projects and their priorities um and uh it, it, yeah. right yeah i mean it's 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 an interesting process i'm 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 learning so thank you um anything yeah anything else? I, I have other questions um you know, you, in early on, you talked about uh, participation by the community. You had these community, uh, virtual community workshops. I'm kind of curious, uh, did you get little, moderate, large participation from these workshops? It depends on the context of your community, but I would say the, uh, there was participation to the robustness of it. Uh, it could have been better, uh, probably a handful of people in some, some cases. Uh, to the extent that those participants provided useful information, uh, that was the good part about that. And okay. uh, comments and other things that we received other outside of that are, are also considering too. So collectively, if we had all those voices together, <clears throat> not just at the workshop, but all the different points when we had conversations directly, indirect, directly, uh, those all are contributing to that conversation as well. Yeah. So in general, what was their concern the community? Providing affordability options. Okay. Uh, also looking at how can you in a community to create opportunities for your folks to live in your community through their whole life cycle. Okay. Uh, so what are those opportunities of different housing based on the different cycles of, of, of your life? A number of the comments that you uh, it pointed as a as a body tonight were were articulated by the public as well. So uh, nothing that is uh, surprising. Affordability is always the big monster in the room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but also, how is the city's? What is the city's role in providing opportunity for the community in terms of uh, services or um, um, options for affordability and, and the wraparound services that are associated with that. So generally speaking, and then, you know, uh, Appendix C does provide literally word for word what people said. So um, we don't want to uh, put words in people's mouth if, if the public and the, the staff and other folks, uh, I mean, sorry, the commission wanted to see the verbatim it is in Appendix C. Okay. Um, my other question is, when we got to the surplus numbers or the projected numbers that you showed up there, um, did we have to do, was there any projection of rezoning needed or, or not? No, that's the good part is that yeah. your existing capacity, think of that yellow number that we yeah. talked about the surplus is essentially the build out capacity that is in your land use element of your general plan. Yeah. Look at the land use table that's for the residential component of it, what the capacity that you currently have with your existing policy. Yeah. If we look at the assumptions of affordability, uh, for example, 30 units in an acre or more as far as density can, can be considered opportunities for uh, affordable housing, uh, we allocate those by, by the number. So um, that essentially means you have the existing policy to accommodate your future growth without having to do okay. things like all right. I, that compared yeah, to I think so. We have so much land, un, undeveloped land available. I think that's an advantageous to us. Yeah, and I, I would, I would add. I think you know it, with the, the that the city's the city's done a great job of of managing that in terms of, um, I don't want to say concentration, but you know more, but 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 but, but having. The, the like this 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 transportation hub in down downtown and 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 focusing in, in in areas where if that if they if it does get built it's going to be it's going to be well 
well planned, well built, and well and able to be well managed with with you know the minimal resources, the city resources um, to to do that versus having it spread out throughout the throughout the city. But so I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I would recommend to the city council that they reduce those uh, <laughs> surplus numbers seriously. Well, I I I don't. I, I mean, the, the numbers are what the numbers are. No, their numbers are what we want them to be. Change by zone, though, by zone change, which isn't easy to understand. There are numbers. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, a whole nother um, discussion, right? That would be, that would necessitate why? a complete rezoning. No. Why, why? Density. No. I could change those numbers to 2%. And I could create a model with the existing map that meets those numbers. Can you, can you talk about a little bit how the zoning equates to the number of available, you know, ba ba it's not, based on, based on like a, what, whatever a particular zone designation is, how, how, how do we determine a, a available um, residence for that type of zoning? It's capacity is based on the zoning standards that apply to that particular zone. We get some so, illustrations. So for example, the CUP project you saw for 30 something, 36, and they reduce to 33. It allows for a range of densities. So we assume a range of densities that's um, permitted by that zone to project out a dwelling unit. So for example, a site that you said high, high density was 36 units an acre and it was uh, two acres, the yield of that could be 72. Then we put into it a consideration of, well, if we apply development standards, is there a reduction in that for parking requirements and other things? So we have a methodology to reduce that, typically around 20%. And we use that as a method to calculate the realistic capacity of your existing sites. So we start with the, with the highest potential. So if there's a range of certain number to a certain number per per acre we we start off with the what is the, the maximum potential and then internally we go through and we say well it, it, based on the site based on parking needs based on whatever else we will we, we, we reduce it a, a little bit is though are those those adjustments that that the city makes and i think that's what what you're talking about commissioner hill is those are those adjustments things that are um, statutory or, 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 or are they, is a regulation that, 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 that limits what we can do there? I mean, can we say, for example, we need, we, we decided we want more parking. So that's going to reduce the number of potential um, uh, homes. As long as the, by the state's definition, that it is a realistic projection of reality. And so if we have a methodology that realistically and we can support it through evidence that shows either past performance or some sort of a math problem, if you will, to develop to say, this is how we projected out a realistic capacity of a site. And so that's why, for example, when we look at gross versus net, the, the actual net yield on anything is always going to be a little less because we have to apply development standards and heights and other things to do that. So we make those general planning assumptions to get to that realistic capacity of the sites and that realistic capacity which we call the surplus is really just saying that your existing policy exists that today if we looked at the math and we did that math utilizing your existing land use that exists today those are the numbers that come out and so it's just giving a snapshot to to the state to say here's our number of 6400 odd units that we need to plan for we actually have capacity for more than that. Therefore, we're demonstrating to you we have adequate sites. It doesn't obligate you anything more than uh, saying that you actually have zoning that accommodates more of what your arena need actually is. Existing zoning. Yeah, so, so I guess I guess I mean, if I understand what you're what 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 you're saying is is. That we have, let's just say we have a gross number of ten thousand, um, but we have a net number of seven thousand. Saying that we still meet that number, but you're saying, hey, let's make that net number less by 
by looking maybe a little cl more, more closely at what we've done in the past, um, you know, maybe, I mean, uh, assumptions are assumptions. Yes. I'm putting a political strategy into those numbers <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Oh, I, I go right along with you when it comes to reducing the numbers and fighting for that that lower amount, et cetera, et cetera. I think one of the if we're going if we've tried to do that, um, I don't know how uh, effective we would be in showing that we already provide and and this was a long time ago. The, our numbers that met low income property numbers our numbers we were at 80 five percent of all of our housing at the time met low income requirements as far as cost right we did not meet it because all of the people that live there were not necessarily low income as far as their income and then in addition to that, it did not meet it because we didn't have the restrictions of the housing staying low income housing, quote unquote. So our past performance is a decent record. Well, but as long as we meet that number in the projection and we have a past performance that is close to that. Well, and at that time was when they were trying requiring us to have a lot more housing units when we tried to argue back that we already have a very high inventory of low housing it's just they were occupied or owned mm -hmm. they said you have to provide the new ones and the new ones have to be I think if, if there's this is more of discussion but if there's any other questions for staff at this point we will go ahead and open up public hearing and see if we have anything no, we had not. I'm sorry. <laughs> so go ahead and open up a uh, public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience? Like anybody online? Thank you, Chairman. If anybody on Zoom teleconference would like to participate in item 6C, now's the time to do so. Please raise your hand and I will unmute you. I'm seeing nobody raise their hand. I did receive two e comments, though, if I may recite for the record. Please do. Our first comment was from Karina Sakao. My comments are regarding the housing project. I am for it and I believe that is a great project that comes with many job opportunities for residents of the area, such as myself. I'm also for the local hire requirements and think that it's best the residents of the city get to work near home. I tried the Zoom links and multiple IDs, but I was not able to log on via Zoom or call either, thank you. End of comment. The next comment was from Juan Muniz. Good evening, Council. I'm a representative of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I represent over 5,000 members and families who live in the Riverside County. The majority who get up way before dawn and get home after sun has gone down to provide for their families. Most drive into Orange County and Los Angeles in search of good paying jobs and benefits. Just today, a member called me and he lives in Hemet and asked me to get him a job closer to home because he is driving every day to Hollywood. This housing element would be great, would be a great way of allowing him to provide for his family and work closer to home. Many don't like changes the housing element would bring, but this is progress. We as a city do not look like we did 10 to 20 years ago, but we progress and we will not look the same 10 to 20 years from now, but we will progress. Let's keep our residents close to their loved ones and pass the housing elements and attach local skilled and train requirements. Thank you. End of comment. Thank you. Anything else from public? All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. All right. Um, I mean, I don't, does the, 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 the housing element is more about residences, not necessarily jobs right so 
All right. Um, further discussion? Well, you know my opinion. If I make a recommendation, I'm going to add that we lower those surplus numbers. Well, if I, I'd like to, I'd like to maybe get a little more, let's get a little more information, and maybe Director King, you can, you can help with this. What, uh, can you, and what, what would be involved? What, what would be the process if? we were to ask the, the council to have staff go back and and re reevaluate those the 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 criteria to develop a net number that is closer to what the arena requirements are so that we're more in line correct if I'm wrong, with so that we're closer to the arena requirements in terms of available land so we don't have as much of a surplus so I'll make uh, certain comments and then uh, Lauren can uh, tap into the legal side of it. So I do understand what uh, Commissioner Hill is asking for. However, uh, as Dave Marquis has mentioned, that there are certain parameters that we would apply to all the zoning regulations. So meaning if a site has a range of say 18 to 30 units to the acre, uh, we take the high end 30, and then we would apply to all the requirements of setbacks, parking, and so on. And that may reduce down to say 25. Well, that number is a true number that is backed up by our development standards, our uh, parking requirements, setbacks, and so on. If we ambiguously lower that number, the ACD is going to require, how did you get to that number? And if we don't have a backup data that shows that because now uh, let's say the apartment requires two parking spaces per unit, but now you just said, oh, we're gonna require four parking spaces per unit. Well, we don't have that backup as an adopted standard within our municipal code. So therefore that argument of lowering the number in um, just to meet or just above the required number is not going to uh, meet the standards or be upheld by uh, the backup data that we need to provide to ACD. So we have to go by based on the existing zoning and general plan density allowances that are adopted by council. Yeah, but did you go through and calculate the numbers based on using the lowest number possible? to meet that goal. That's right, my, so, that's, that's what I'm saying is there's gotta be a range in there that the model can be adjusted. Right, so the HCD doesn't look at the lower range number. They look at the maximum capacity that is allowed within that zoning. So only way for us to lower that number is to apply the standards that we have in our development standards, which would be parking setbacks, outdoor space, um, it, um, you know, those type of standards that we can say because of these things, um, maybe it's road widening, because of these things, their net acreage is going to be reduced. Therefore, they could only have X number of units per acre. So we can't start from the lowest number because that's not the highest and the maximum capacity that land allows for. Can you give some sense of what the difference is between what the highest number was and then once we applied all of our standards and policies, what the, uh, that net number, so what's, what's the delta? How much was it reduced? Uh, I believe David has uh, mentioned that it's a, approximately 20% reduction from the actual number that was the highest. Okay. Mm -hmm. That reduction based on what you just described. <laughs> And so, from a legal per perspective, we the, the we have to provide backup via standards and and, and the policies that we have um, to the state to say this is this is the this is the basis for the reduction of twenty percent. Right. Right. So, um, from a legal perspective, obviously, we have to give the state honest numbers when um, it comes to our existing capacity. 
Um, also, um, we would never be able to, to go to those sites and, and downzone them in any way because that would also be a violation of, of state law. SB 330 prohibits us from reducing the um, intensity of use of residential parcels. So the intensity that exists now will be the intensity that has to exist going forward. And so that's just to piggyback off of um, what HP said, um, not only are we um, limited on what we can, can do with those numbers, um, but we also, HCD's already seen the, the draft. Um, we don't wanna go back and look like we're um, trying to manipulate the numbers or, or cook the books either. We want it to be a honest um, statement of what our existing capacity is. I think it's also, it's, it's if, if we were to go back and change setback requirements and things to, you know, instead of 20%, make a 30% reduction, then that we might end up shooting ourselves in the foot because we would have to change our you know, requirements. And then when a developer comes in, they may or may not, you know, that may impact the affordability and the economics of that project. I'm not asking to go that deep. I'm not asking to rezone. I'm not asking to change the policies. I'm just asking to run the numbers through a model again that takes into account what I just said. I, 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 I got to believe that there is a range there that can be tweaked. It's not a finite number. It's a projection. It's a, it's, it, I don't know. I, I, I just can't believe that it's just that concrete of a number. Correct. So the number is a projection, as you say. Uh, however, the projection is there so to do multiple things. One is to provide the adequate housing needs for the region. Two is to promote development. And if we have such a restrictive standards, uh, let's say now we require four parking spaces for the argument sake for each unit, then developers builders won't come in order to build that because it takes so much money to build, yet they will have reduction in their number of units total. So it won't pencil out, so therefore they won't build, meaning we'll still be stuck with the same amount of number at the end of the eight-year cycle. So there's a fine balance that you need to provide that can stimulate development, but at the same time, um, equally distribute the housing needs for all uh, economic segments of our community. And do you feel comfortable, does, does staff feel, feel comfortable that, that the, so we started with that, that higher number, the potential, the max potential, and that 20% reduction was based on, on all of our requirements. Do we feel comfortable that that, 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 that is a very valid and, and, uh, um, um, comprehensive analysis of our requirements to, to come up with that 20%. Is there, is there, is there, is there room for um, uh, tweaking? Uh, uh, what's the, maybe not tweaking is the right word, but calibration. <laughs> we don't find you. Is there, is there, is there room for calibration uh, um, in, 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 in that, in that, in those standards and those requirements. Absolutely. We have taken all different aspects and considerations for the housing element. And um, just to kind of put it in perspective, even though we identify a site for, um, say, uh, a low income housing, if that particular property owner does not want to build low income housing and they rather build market rate, then that property owner has the right to do so. However, city now is up to the task of finding that loss of low-income housing parcel somewhere else. So it's a constant movement of how we're going to meet that number uh, within that eight-year cycle and how we can still stimulate development as we go through that eight-year cycle. And here's my argument is too, is that because of what they require in order to qualify for low-income, um, the housing that has just been built that wasn't restricted to low income in our valley 
um, qualifies for low income for the region because of the price. But because it doesn't have those restrictions on it, then we don't get the points for it. Isn't that correct? I don't believe that's how it works. Um, uh, it, Dave, I, can you speak a little to that? Well, for instance, we just had 82 houses built right behind me uh, that were the, the, the uh, citrus estates. They didn't have the restrictions on them, but the pricing, although it went up during the, the construction, the pricing would fit into the region's uh, low income pricing. So, but we don't get points for those because they weren't restricted. Well, you do get points in the sense that think about it two time periods. First part is uh, pre adoption, we're identifying the sites that you would accommodate your growth need. Let's say you adopt it today. Here, moving forward for the next eight years, you're going to have different projects, different price points, and all that. At that certification of occupancy, whatever that pr price point is a determining factor that we can count, if you will, as credit towards that. So when we look at our uh, performance review over the course of every year, as we look through that and SB 35 and other things will compel us to do that year over year in our reporting requirements, that gives us the ammunition to say, well, it may just be um, a market rate, what we call it just a single family unit, but the price point qualifies for that affordability level, then that's a good thing. It, then we get those points, we get, so 82 houses that sold at those prices and, and actually fit into that low income rate category, we got 82 houses towards that 6,466. I would return your, we get points for it to, we are demonstrating that we are making progress in our arena obligations. As, so basically we went from right at 8,000 requirement and that reduced to 20%, which equals the 6,466 roughly, but where we went from being required to, and so we did get that reduction of 20%. Reduction of 20% is in regards to our capacity. So the, our, our surplus represents the 20% reduction of capacity based on standards, right? So, yeah, so, so our, if we would have gone with just what is available based on zoning and use the high end of that zoning, our, our surplus would have been, would, would have been higher. The, the surplus was reduced because of the 20% reduction. This, the, the, the RENA numbers are or the reading numbers that's set it's not a it's not we don't have the ability to move those numbers i think we're let's not show let's not show so much surplus because we don't want skag to come in and say and reallocate the percentage of those rena numbers to be higher for low income in the city of emmett versus the city of marietta and so what you would like to see is a lower surplus number on on the on maybe some of those those categories to show that hey we don't have the capacity in the city so don't give us any any, any more i think what what this what director king and council has 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 articulated is that we don't have the we don't have the backup to increase that reduction beyond the 20 percent within our current standards and requirements i don't believe that I don't believe it. How do you know what the builders are going to build? You don't know what they're going to build. It's the formula on the capability. I get that. But you could take the numbers in the low income and reduce them down and add them to the higher income and still not mess with any policies, any laws, any zoning whatsoever. I, I, Am I making sense? Is is anybody following what I'm saying here? Well, I I, I personally I, I understand the the intent, and I also um, understand my understanding from 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 what the city is from what staff is saying is that we you 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 when you put inputs into a model, you have to be able to have that you you have to be able to show 
the basis of those inputs. And so the basis absolutely the basis of those inputs are our zoning or our, our requirements, our our building requirements, our parking spots per 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 residence, our setbacks, and th- those types of of things. And and that and the city has feels comfortable that we have gone through and 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 thoroughly evaluated each particular um zone or or or, or parcel to say this is this is the max that could be there but because of setbacks because of all of these other requirements the we we don't we can't have the max we can only have this much what what would need to happen to reduce that surplus number is to look at the max and say well we actually we can't put 100 homes on there we can only put 80 homes well why well it's what's the why the why would have to be based on something right and 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 so we have to be able to show and prove that the that that the reason we reduced it more than 20 percent is because of something right and 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 i think that that we 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 feel comfortable that we have that's well i'll tell you why because we're trying to bring in higher tech companies we're trying to look to the future for higher tech uh jobs and that's why and so it's going to take up more higher income housing to satisfy those people to live here but there's there's a there's an explanation for the change in the numbers I, yeah i don't so I, but your general plan doesn't prove it because your general plan has yeah, it, your, it's in our general plan but i mean your 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 zoning that you have laid out and, and tell me if i'm wrong if i'm going with this the zoning that we have laid out and the and the adoption of our general plan and we had our general plan review visions and everything um i which I would greatly, I would like to see us greatly increase our M zoning, our industrial zoning, because it is very little. I've been trying to show that kind of property uh, to someone and we are lacking because most of it's encumbered either by the airport or by the, or by the uh, vernal pools and ferry shrimp or whatever. So to, to what you're saying, our, so much of our land that is zoned residential is kind of it used to be almost kind of by default um the change in anything residential was uh pretty taboo we didn't ever hardly do it um however there is a need for other kinds of zoning and to accommodate people who are like the guy driving out of town now he might be driving out of town because he's in construction and construction would be the work he would do here. But there's plenty others that are driving out of town because we don't have the uh, manufacturing or the industrial or the even the warehousing um, availability of that kind of land to, to increase the jobs here. So I, I'm, I'm trying to, Trying to work on a justification here, <laughs> if we could, and I don't know if this is something that it, it, it and you have been very patient with us because every time you've come, we've hit you with a bunch of things. But I, I don't know <laughs> if it's something that we ask staff to go back and in detail tell us why we can or can't do what you're questioning, mm-hmm. or if we have a clear cut answer to say, no, you guys are barking up the wrong tree. We have done what we absolutely the most we can do to um, to justify what you're talking about. I'm just trying to add to the strategy here. I mean, we're, this is for the next, what, nine years, eight years. We're talking about a long projection here. Well, but 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 I think there's 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 two pieces here. One is one is the Rena projections, which are not accurate based on past performance. The Rena projections are overly optimistic. Yeah, we can't change that. But but then what comes out of that is the surplus in the in, in the different categories, and that surplus might drive might help be a 
uh, the, the kind of the criteria for how we evaluate what you're talking about in terms of you know the, the, the rezoning or, or or changes to our land use to 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 maybe better align with with our with our our, our general plan um, and and that's 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 uh, cart before the horse or whatever I mean I, we're not to go back to the state now and say and, and and try to develop numbers that are not based on what we have published to the public in terms of our I think what it does is it provides us an opportunity to look at where are some areas that maybe we need to adjust and change over the next um, eight years to to better align uh, our zoning and, and our requirements with our general plan and what we are trying to to accomplish. But whether or not this particular um, uh, uh, forum is the right place for that, um, I I don't I don't think so. Well, you know, at this point, I think I think it's I don't think it's too late. I mean, we haven't submitted a final. Right. No, we have not, but HCD has seen our draft. They have already made comments on our draft. Right. So if we, if, well, our comments on our draft uh, and our, we're, we're not passing it, the city council will be passing it. Correct. And what we're doing is sending city council our recommendations. Based on our current standards, uh, I don't think we could accomplish anything else. Um, the, again, the amount of the number that we're allocated through ARENA is 6,466 units that the city should have an opportunity for future builders to come in and build. Now, that number is there. We're stuck with that. Great. However, However, the, the way that we look at our current zoning and general plan designation is what it is. We cannot change the zoning now to... Read. Okay. So we cannot change the zoning. We cannot change the general plan amendment. The general plan amendment gives us the density factors for each of those areas. So at 6,466, the low income, I believe, is somewhere in the... 1400 low and uh, low moderate somewhere in there so it's approximately 20 to 25 percent that we're uh, required to build as a low and um, moderate low income housing so every city will have to go through that similar breakdown of how much they need to build for upper end and the lower end and we just okay. happen to have we we happen to have a higher capacity for all of the ca the categories. The highest over capacity that we have, the surplus capacity that we have, is actually in the above in the above moderate um, income. We 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 have more capacity to facilitate above moderate than we do relatively than we do for the below moderate. Uh, I get that. I understand. So, so what you're what you would like to see is less surplus all the way around or less surplus in certain categories less surplus in the lower income area and and so 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 then you would have to look if, correct me if i'm wrong you would have to whatever criteria that you use in terms of reducing the 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 percentage or the 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 total potential development within the the the, the zones that are that would that are conducive for low income, what you would have to do that across the board to all. Correct. And just because we go back and change the development standards for say multifamily, doesn't mean that that multifamily will become low income. That could be a high end multifamily designation. So that even if we change the standards, it's up to the builders 
if they want to build low-income housing units or high-income housing units. And that could go for R3, R4 units, or zoned land areas, or R1 zoned areas. So there's really no way to project and how we can reduce one segment of uh, rental bracket than the other. I think you just made my point. Because there's what you talked about right there is a variance. I'm you sorry? Can't, you, you, can't, you can't predict what the builders are going to do. Correct. And there's a variance there. Correct. But the maximum capacity for each of the land area is what it is. What you're asking is, if correct me if I'm wrong, what you're asking is that you want the lower end units to have less surplus. Yes. There's no way that we can do that through the means that we have available to us. What if nobody builds in all those zoning areas? Then nobody that are builds income? in those areas. Yeah, then we just rezone. <sighs> then within the next update, we will, we will show that we've either met or we have not met any one of those categories right but, right but at this point the capacity is there based on our land use based on our zoning the capacity is there for to to meet the All right. numbers got it i i hear you i think we're at an impasse okay so is there a motion uh, just clarification, uh, page 49, I think there's a typo if you're presenting this, but here, and low income and moderate income are flipped around, I believe. Page 49. Page, 49. And page 52, the moderate income is both different numbers, 272 and 260, so I'm not sure what clarification that is, but on page 49, where it says housing cost, and it gives you very low, extremely low income, very low income, I believe that's flipped around accidentally. The number. Do you say low income is 260 for housing costs, but moderate income is 174? And what's Paris doing to lead dropping homeless population every year and while we keep increasing? <laughs> we'll verify that and make the correction. Any other discussion, comments? My, like I said, for me, my, my big takeaway is that we are the, the, the basis for planning at the top, at the state level and how that trickles down is, it, it sure seems like we should, there should be a process in place for calibrating what those arena numbers are, not just in terms of total over, you know, statewide, but also in geographic distribution as far as what actually happens. I think the next cycle will probably see um, a, a that 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 the, the those projections were overly optimistic. Maybe in some of the more urban areas, maybe they were a little, you know, less optimistic in some of the rural areas and. And statewide, they were yeah, we we had a decrease in 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 numbers. So I, but in any case, um, we'll entertain a motion, one way or the other. I'll recommend adoption of Planning Commission resolution finding that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA in accordance with fifteen o sixty one b three of California Environmental. Quality Act CEQA guidelines and recommend that the Hemet City Council adopt general plan amendment 21-001 housing element update six cycle for 21 to Motion carries a four to one. Commissioner Hill voting negative.
Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, with that, so we'll move on to department reports, city attorney reports. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So this past legislative session, the state passed over 30 new housing bills. Um, the city attorney's office is working closely with staff on the implementation of the bills. Uh, some may require ordinances and changes to the municipal code. So the planning commission may be seeing these items in the upcoming months. Um, there are at least three areas uh, where the city can expect to be impacted. Um, the first is in our single family zoning. SB9, uh, which has been referred to as the duplex bill, is now in effect and it requires that the city ministerially approve without discretionary review or public hearing two unit residential developments and lot splits on parcels zoned for single family use. In our multifamily zones, SB 478 will be restricting the development standards that we can impose on housing developments consisting of three to 10 units, um, specifically related to floor area ratio and um, lot coverage requirements. And we'll be seeing some changes in uh, density bonus law as well. Um, the legislature regards the density bonus laws being underutilized. So incentives are being added um, and the state's also imposing additional obligations on the city to ensure affordability. And um, there were also several changes to housing element law, uh, development impact fees and affordable housing laws among other things. Uh, most of these changes will be impacting city staff and not the commission, uh, but if the commission would like a formal report on the bills, I'd be happy to bring back an update as a receive and file at a future meeting. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, especially considering this discussion, I mean, the, 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 it's, an, it's, an, it's important that we understand what, what we have the ability to do and what we don't have the ability to do. Um, yeah, I would, I would certainly appreciate a more detailed report. And, you know, one of the things that has bothered me a little bit is the ministerial approval of things where we don't have the opportunity for public comment. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, is where they're, they're, I personally see a big risk there. Um, it's, it's, it's understanding that we want to be streamlined in terms of how we approve projects, but the whole purpose of this process is to allow the existing residents to voice their opinion and voice, voice their concerns. And, and the more we do away with, with um, public hearing, the less opportunity we have for the public input. Yes, please. Yeah. I will do that. And that's all I have, Chair. Any development reports? Uh, Chair, the December 28th meeting was canceled for council, so I don't have any updates for you. Future agenda items. The coming before you in the future will be the downtown specific plan amendment. Uh, we have a couple items that we need to correct in there uh, to allow for uh, some flexibility within the specific plan. Uh, we have a second story ordinance coming before you, as well as the outdoor seating for parklets. So these are uh, possibly giving some leeway for uh, outdoor dining on a uh, commercial strip. Uh, that will take up some of the parking spaces uh, that are in the shopping area, as well as a Holiday Inn Express along uh, Florida Avenue in the future. So we'll have more opportunities for specific plan amendments and discussion. <laughs> Commissioner reports. All right, Commissioner Hill. I have nothing to report, thank you. Commissioner Beamsterfer. Not the report. Commissioner Lemke. I don't have anything to report except for uh, people have been asking me about the Marshalls that is going next door to um, Burlington and that there's already an existing Marshall. So is that gonna be empty? Do we have plans for that Marshalls that's moving? Do we know anything about that? Cause I know it's existing. So I don't know how that works. I don't have any information for you tonight, but I'll get that for you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Vice Chair Van Arsdale. And Chair Worth. Just uh, happy birthday. That was my statement. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I think we should adjourn in honor of Commissioner Beamsdorfer. 
he has reached a monumental, and I won't make it public, uh, <laughs> birthday. But I want to thank him for spending all this time tonight and being so patient with us on his big birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Good 40. Oh. Or, uh, I didn't. <laughs> It was a long time ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, happy birthday, and we will be adjourned until January uh, 18th.